This is Dr. Radio, powered by the NYU Langone Medical Center, and we welcome you to this program. Our guest today, Wendy Maltz, is an author, speaker, and sex therapist who's in private practice with her husband, Larry Maltz, in Eugene, Oregon. And she's here today to talk about her book, The Porn Trap, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Problems Caused by Pornography. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Hello. Happy to be here. Well, we're very, very glad to help you, and to have you, rather, <laughs> and to have you help our listeners, uh-huh. some of whom may have partners who are really into porn, but they're not. And we would invite them to share their stories with us and ask you, our expert, all their questions. What is it that got you to write the book, The Porn Trap, Wendy? Well, you know, I've been a sex and relationship therapist for about 30 years now, and what I, um, I started noticing back around 2000, um, as the Internet became more popular, um, clients started coming in complaining of pornography problems in large numbers. I mean, every week I'd get several calls, and it was kind of like, What's going on? Did somebody put something in the, you know, water, water. supply? <laughs> <laughs> no, they put something on the Internet. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and before then, um, pornography would come up occasionally in doing marital or sex and relationship therapy, but not that frequently. Often it was couples trying to decide, you know, um, if they would watch it together and what they would watch. But all of a sudden, there were people calling, saying um, a, a lot from partners of uh, men who uh, were into, had gotten into porn heavily, and they were saying their marriages were breaking up, or um, their, they were canceling their plans to get married. Um, so and you would find it was primarily the women who were calling up, saying that the men were into the porn. Yes, I mean, okay, a, a lot. Sometimes I'd get men calling up. Uh, sometimes single men saying, I don't know what's happening to me, but um, my whole sexuality is changing, and I'm scared. And I'm, I've gotten into looking at, at, at things and, and masturbating to things that I never thought I would in the past. And, and, and I'm hearing more and more of this um, all well, in, well, in recent thi- years, too. The thing is, with the Internet and, and something else we've noticed here at our program in Human Sexuality, the same questions about porn that you've received and also a uh, complaint that we used to hear pretty rarely. A, a, a complaint we get often from women is they have a hard time reaching an orgasm. But that had been a very rare complaint for men uh, unless they were ill yeah. or really uh, getting very much up there in their late 70s, 80s, really. And uh, even though they couldn't climax as quickly at that age, they could pretty well climax. And with the watching of porn, that was a problem that came up more and more. And the answer really was that the men were masturbating. Um, yeah, to pornography. Yes. Not to just thoughts of their, their partners exactly. or, or past pleasurable sex experiences they had had. But there is something about this product that can desensitize a person um, that, and desensitize their sexuality. It's kind of like an over. It's an overstimulation. Somebody uh, I heard likened it to putting a jet fuel in a lawnmower. Uh-huh. It just kind of burns. Can burn things out, you know, pretty quickly. And then people, uh, it causes uh, in the brain. It causes a dopamine dysregulation in in a similar way that eating a lot of junk food might or high-fat food, high-sugar food, um, or, or having um, hard drugs can. And then what can happen is then the person finds themselves being less able to get stimulated by the kinds of things that they had been prior to this very intense uh, conditioning and training in, in overstimulation. Well, there are there are two uh, alphabetic acronyms that are applied to uh, overuse of internet porn, and one is ACE and its uh, accessibility and convenience and escape, and the other is AAA and that's 
accessibility and affordability and anonymity. Mm -hmm. But a, a question that I'd like to ask you is, does it make a difference as to what the porn is, what the substance is of the pornography, or is it just the porn in and of itself? Uh, it does, it does and it doesn't, okay? Um, a person can get into, if they get into compulsive use of any kind of strong visual stimulation and, and, and accustom their sexuality to uh, a voyeuristic approach to sex where it's very image-based and looking, that can create some problems. But the most serious problems we're, we're finding have to do with people who spin off into content that is um, what's called like the gonzo variety of porn, the very hardcore. And, w and w dis describe, if you would, what gon that's, a, that's an interesting word, what gonzo variety is. What does that it's, in involve? It's based on, uh, a, a lot on violence against women. Uh -huh. It's um, where people are used just as objects, and there's... Uh, um, like the, uh, the uh, less common types of sexual interaction, rough blow jobs, um, okay. uh, rough anal sex, um, okay. things of uh, that people don't ordinarily do. Right, with each and there other. are things that I could mention, you know, that can could curl people's eyelids. And so I'll let's refrain let's from not do that. that. <laughs> right, uh, you know, and and uh, it, it, when you think of it, pornography is a very visual product. It is a very commercial, industry-based product, and it relies on, on presenting novel stimuli that hasn't been seen before, more intense, more hardcore, this kind of thing. And so as there's been more um, pornography out there, uh, the, the, the porn makers have kind of vied to, to create harder and harder stuff. And there are some countries with... Uh, laws and regulations against these the more violent types of porn, but we don't have them in the U.S. And what countries do have them? That's interesting. Um, well, I know they've been in Australia, I think, and in England. I think and maybe Canada. I'm not sure. Okay. that um, There have been, um, I think there, there are some regulations. I know I traveled up to Canada, and uh, my husband and I, when we go to the motels, we like to see, okay, what's the lineup for the porn here, <laughs> you know? in the pay-per-view, and it's, it was interesting to note that um, on some of the major hotel chains will have a very a different lineup in the United States than in Canada, and what they're leaving out are these more extreme varieties when you get to Canada that, that you can then have access to here in the States. You are listening to sexual health and well-being. This is Dr. Virginia Sadok on Sirius 114 and XM 119, and I'm director of the program in human sexuality at NYU Langone Medical Center. And my guest today is Wendy Maltz, an experienced sex therapist and author with her husband, Larry Maltz, of The Porn Trap. And if any of you out there have questions about sexuality or think that your partner may be involved in porn, or perhaps you'd like to get your partner involved in porn, and uh, she, because most often a she, is, is unwilling to do so, why don't you give us a ring? We are at 1-877-NYU-DOCS. That's 1-877-698-3627. Or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. Wendy, when you get these people coming in, either the man saying my sexuality is changing and I'm not happy with it, or the woman saying our our sex life is going down the drain, or I've seen him watching porn and he's not coming near me anymore, what are the approaches to to help this situation? Well, often one of the uh, repercussions that happens in couple relationships is that as one person has gotten involved with porn, they've kind of uh, gotten more emotionally distant and um, into their own kind of secret world with it. It's not something, hey, honey, you know, what'd you do while I <laughs> went shopping, you know, <laughs> or, or let me tell you what I did while you went shopping. It's, it's something that 
that is often uh, surrounded by a lot of dishonesty and deception. And uh, is that because the person is secretly ashamed of it? Um, oh, yeah, they're ashamed, or they have promised not to do it, and then um, have been unable to stay away from porn use. So there's often for the uh, it, it, you know it's typically a man using in, in a uh, uh, heterosexual relationship that upsets the female. The women can be affected similarly to. Um, uh, what happens when a, a woman might discover that her husband's been or male partner's been having an affair. And you have this sense of incredible betrayal because what's happened is that porn use has become a priority over honesty in the relationship. And so there's this sense that this other thing has, and sexually relating with this other thing as product, um, and these images of other women or other people on the internet or and in DVDs has become more important than the um, the sexual relating in the in the relationship. And when people get really into porn a lot, they develop kind of a uh, an approach to sex that can be very off putting to a real life partner. And Such a real as... life partner can end up feeling kind of used and abused in sex or ignored, but, but treated more like an object. And they kind of go, he's not there with me, you know. He's, he's like he's, he's in his own mind, and he often is uh, uh, re- actually relating to porn uh, mentally while. And the intimacy is gone. The intimacy is gone. Porn sex is very different than a love-based, an intimacy-based sex. It's, um, it, it, it it has to do with, uh, you know, tre- seeing people as objects and with um, this image-based relating, and it's it's separate from love. It's it's a uh, can be very compulsive, and it, it it can focus on kind of using someone or doing something to someone. It and almost makes it sound as you're describing it, it, it and it's this paradox, a little non-sexual. It's it's almost as if uh, sexual desire is not driving this, but the desire to feel desire is driving this. The desire to have an orgasm is driving this, but but not the desire of just enjoying the interplay between two people. Oh, definitely. Um, um, you know, you can look at the type of sexual arousal that goes on when a person's relating with porn is much more like uh, getting drugs. It's a it's a, an arousal of the whole system. It's not necessarily focused on orgasm. Orgasm can be part of it, but it's often the buzz. It's essentially the uh, the release of dopamine that's going on, and you can have dopamine spiking, dopamine coming and pouring into these uh, reward circuitry parts of the brain in similar fashions that, that drugs do. And, and so you get the person wanting to kind of maintain that buzz, that high, and, and people who are heavily into porn will talk about it in much the same way as a, a drug addict talks about their, uh, what it's like to take a drug. So it's, it's, it's really kind of lear- using that sexual stimulation to medicate uh, for feelings of uh, depression or boredom, or um, that are often and dissatisfaction that are often ironically created by doing a lot of porn use itself. So, um, so somebody can get hooked into it. Really, you are listening to sexual health and well-being here on Sirius 114 and XM 119. This is your host, Dr. Virginia Sadock, and my guest today is Wendy Maltz, author of The Porn Trap, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Problems Caused by Pornography. You know, I I wonder if uh, some uh, people out there are listening to us and and wondering, should should I call in and uh, ask about this? This is something that's, that's bothering me. By all means do. This is the time to, to speak to me and speak to our expert, Wendy Maltz. Uh, porn is something that's uh, talked about 
sort of sub rosa in dirty jokes in locker rooms uh even I'm remembering uh, a play that ran for uh, quite a while on Broadway, Q Street, and one of the uh, songs in it was about what guys do on computers, and every other <laughs> line was, and, you know, do it to do my emails, do it to do my spreadsheets, and porn, and you're, porn. Right, you're and thinking porn. of Avenue Q. Yes. The internet is yes. for porn. Poor porn, yeah. Yeah. There's that song. And, and you know, it, what's, it's... Um, it's interesting. Radio is a great uh, medium for talking about these problems and then, and discussing them because it is a difficult thing often for people to, um, you know, step forward. And the, the the radio provides this kind of uh, this anonymity that yes. that can be great for it. Um, we need to be doing more discussion about uh, pornography. People need to be sharing more that they're having problems. It's, it's a very common cause of a relationship breakup now. Um, I, I th you mentioned before that uh, it does cause relationship breakup, and I c can hear and have heard men saying, you know, what, what, what are you talking about? I'm not, I'm not being unfaithful. This is not a live person. I'm, I'm not uh, seeing anybody. I'm, I'm here with you. I have no intention uh, about leaving you, and yet the woman does feel so betrayed and, uh, and deprived. Right. Well, it is, uh, you know, it, women who are in relation in long-term relationships report the use of porn of their partner as, as a uh, as cheating. Uh, about there are some studies that show that. Um, uh, let's see. I think it's a, a third of all women see that porn use is cheating. But if you start. Uh, to looking at parceling that out into women in more long-term relationships like the longer the more long-term it is the more committed the more likely the woman is to uh, see the porn use as a serious threat so someone might go oh i'm dating this guy and he happens to look at porn and, and not be an issue but i'm married to this guy or i'm engaged to this guy who's going to be the future father of my children or you know and and, or you know who has who has pledged fidelity, and then all of a sudden you have a different dynamic there where it really does feel like a com competing um, sexual outlet. And I think this is what oh, I got so amazed as a sex and relationship therapist to find out to hear from people that the porn was actually usurping the. Um, enjoyment and uh, the power of sex in a real life relationship. In other words, you, uh, people can really get into it more at the expense of, of a, a real relationship. Absolutely. We have a caller on the line now here, Lisa from Kansas City. Hello, Lisa. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I had an 18-year uh, marriage that ended because of uh, pornography addiction, and it was probably four years into my marriage that I realized, <laughs> and you could time it with the rise of the Internet, yes. um, it, that I realized that pornography really was such an issue. And, of course, uh, a couple of children, you know, young married, uh, you know, you're going to do everything you can to try and make your marriage work. Um, but, oh, man, it just took over our lives. Oh, and, I'm um, so sorry to hear our, that. Our, yeah, it was, it was tough. Uh, emotionally, uh, uh, emotionally absent from, uh, from our relationship, certainly sexually absent from our relationship. And even though, oh, I probably realized, uh, it, through uh, through quite a bit of counseling together and individually, um, I thought that I was being strong by staying in the marriage, but really I kind of realized I was being weak by staying in the marriage. And and really what really brought it to a head was uh, one of my young children, a young daughter, actually um, found a stash of pornography. Mm-hmm. Of, ma of uh, magazines or of, of on the internet or what? Well, you know, 
We used multimedia pornography. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this was the magazines that uh, she found um, at, at a, you know, at 11. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah. that was it. Yeah, that, no, that's a very vulnerable age. And, and one right. of the things that happens, of course, is one of the things that happens to us as people as we develop is our first exposure to sexuality is very, very important and has an imprinting and, kind of effect. And, and interestingly enough, I did find out, I thought it was something that had just started shortly after our marriage, but through the counseling I had found out that it was something he had started at around the age of 14. Yeah. At, yeah. And at that time it was magazines. Yes. And then... Um, I think really with uh, a number of stresses, like a lot of addictions, kind of really exacerbated it. And then, gosh, you know, with the Internet, um, you know, no getting away from it. And and, uh, and it, it even was to the point where it was uh, using the Internet on at work. Mm-hmm. And, we, and that caused a job loss, of course. Oh, oh my goodness! Yeah, uh-huh. and it was, uh, you know, it it, it was something, uh, it, and it was it was a choice. You know, at that point, I was ready. I, I guess I would have to say, my child finding the porn almost did me a favor because, mm-hmm. man, it it slapped me in the face. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. thank you very much for sharing your story, Lisa, as as sad as it is, but you sound as though you're doing all right now, which is... Oh, uh, actually, um, I would say things have never been better, and uh, the, I would say the unfortunate thing was uh, I probably, get going through the divorce, and I did need to uh, eventually kind of level with my children about why I ended up getting divorced. Mm -hmm. And it was never that, uh, it was never pornography. It was just always talked about as an addiction. Well, Mm -hmm. I I think you handled that, and I assume you had counseling to do it, as well as it could possibly have been handled. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear how strong you feel right now. And thank you very much for sharing your story, Lisa. And anyone who would like to call, not necessarily to share a story, but certainly if you would like to, or to ask any questions about pornography or how to deal with it or what is just normal use of it or excessive use of it, please call us at 1-877-NYU-DOCS. That's 1-877-698-3627. You're listening to Dr. Virginia Sadock on sexual health and well-being. And my guest today is Wendy Maltz, the author of the very interesting The Porn Trap, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Problems Caused by Pornography. And I'd like to go to our next caller now, who is Denise from Washington, D.C. Hi, Denise. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, it's been really interesting listening to the previous caller because I have friends that are in this trap and um, they have very young children and we were talking and they kind of just seem to be stuck and not knowing how to move forward and get the right kind of help or what kind of help are out there. I, I would say neither one of them are, are big um, fans of counseling, so I just didn't know what options were available, and if we could talk maybe about uh, moving forward and solutions. Sure. Wendy, what would you suggest? Well, you know, it, because porn, um, pornography problems is a very difficult topic for a lot of people to talk with their doctors, their family, their friends, and, all, and, and um, even for a counselor, that's why uh, my husband Larry and I wrote The Porn Trap as a starting point because it shares a lot of stories of people who got into porn, found out they had a problem with it, and then the whole, a whole half of the book is devoted to what it takes to overcome these problems, both as an individual and as a couple. And, and then it also has a whole big resource section on the, uh, that gives information on the online uh, resources as well as programs um, uh, and other books, and um, 
I, uh, how to find counselors in it. But, you know, a lot of people combine some counseling with like a 12-step program with uh, Sexaholics Anonymous. Um, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. So just getting really informed about what this is. You know, pornography does not come with a warning label. Like, you know, we have drugs, and you get a whole page of information of the possible Or a package of cigarettes. Yeah, and, but there's nothing that really says, hey, this is a, a product that can destroy relationships. It can, it can impair um, and, and harm a person's self-esteem it, and integrity because of the lying and, and deception that goes on. And the uh, being focused on something that goes ag- often against uh, a person's values, being attached to something that, that makes a person ha- um, have to act uh, in conflict with the, uh, the actual goals they have, you know, and it, that it is addictive and um, that, uh, you know, there are serious problems. Like uh, uh, the woman before, Lisa, who had called in, you know, not only the family disruption but also getting into uh, losing a job or legal problems, let's say if someone gets into accessing child pornography, things like that. So, is it, yeah. When you, say, when you say it's addictive, is it like addictive in, in the sense that you can trade that addiction for smoking or you continue to, I mean, so from an addictive personality perspective? Some, I some mean, people. So like some addictive people, you know, quit smoking and take up drinking and then, take, you know, quit drinking and take up drugs, you know? I mean, are we looking at it's just that continuous of a vicious cycle? Well, it. It can uh, be used, like some, I've heard of people who've quit drinking and then got into porn for their high, or, but often um, uh, pornography problems do start, uh, often start when a person is younger and, and are uh, exposed to pornography in adolescence, and, and it's often something that a person does bring into a relationship. Uh, I- I that, think think yeah. here one of the things that you mentioned, Wendy, would be very helpful, which is you can look at the porn as an addiction, and you can go to the 12-step program, Sexaholic Anonymous, Love and Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sex Addicts Anonymous, and you can also have individual counseling that when you get rid of of the symptom, which is you trying to abstain from looking at the porn, you can in counseling address so you don't get into another addiction. You can address what's making you so vulnerable to it, what's making you depressed, what's making you anxious. Yes, and a a lot of people have very, that's a good point, but a lot of people have uh, very strong rationalizations about pornography, our culture uh, has put those out for years, and it was a, a lot of them are based on what porn used to be like. We didn't think of it as an addictive product, but the way it's delivered now is similar to it's delivered on what's called an interval ratio system, and uh, and when you get on demand porn um, online or through cable, you've got the the person just like a gambler in Vegas playing the slot machines is looking for those triple sevens coming up on the slot machine, all three sevens in a row for the uh, to, to win. And what happens is people will peruse pornography looking for that particular image that gives them that dopamine high that spikes their system, gives them a, a boost of a feeling of sexual arousal. And they don't know when it's coming, but they know if they keep looking, they'll eventually find it. So they can stay at it for a long time, and um, it, it's very similar. It runs a course similar to like a gambling addiction, um, and so this is a this is a product that kind of morphed, and also with it how it's more extreme and more violent and and more against um, uh, loving relationship uh, scripts. Uh, you you have so you have a product that's really something different than it was before. But people, our culture hasn't caught up. They're still thinking of, oh, it adds a little spice to the relationship, or oh, this is just something I use to help with uh, uh, self stimulation at times or self pleasuring. But it's really changed enormously. Our next caller is Samantha from California. 
You're on the air, Samantha. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if, if our relationship has a, a porn problem. Um, I've been together with my husband for about 13 years. Um, and at first, um, when the Internet first started, I guess, is, is when it really, you know, I was okay with it at first. We were, you know, just dating. Um, and then after a few years, he began to lie to me about how often he would look at porn. So that was a struggle for a few years until, you know, he, I guess, realized that um, it was worse to lie than to actually do it. So, you know, we were okay for a few years. Now we've had a few kids. But he still looks at porn pretty much every chance he gets if I'm not home. You sound like you're mm-hmm. crying, Samantha. I am so sorry. That's all right. Take, take a deep breath and go ahead. So, oh, sorry. That, no. We, we all understand, and everybody who's, who's listening understands. So basically, I mean, I don't know if I'm being too unrealistic, you know, to ask him not to do it at all or not to do it as often. He it doesn't lie about it anymore as far as I can tell. But just the images that I know he's looking at really bother me, and he doesn't seem to understand that. You know, my feelings about it, he's like, well, you shouldn't feel that way about it. So I'm not sure what, what to do. And part of me, you know, I was pregnant, you know, for I had two kids, one right after the other, and a lot of my time was taken up by that, so I kind of don't really think about it. And so now I'm, you know, I'm not into sex as much as I used to be. I also don't care as much as I used to about his viewing porn, but I think that's detrimental to our relationship. So basically, I don't know if I'm being unrealistic with my expectations or he's has a problem with porn. Wendy, would you like to answer that first? Yes. Um, well, you know, I, I really feel for what you're going through. The partners of people who are heavily into porn often feel the, the powerlessness that you're feeling and the confusion about it. Um, it and the thing is, if you say nothing there's a, or you, you tolerate it, you're, you do run the risk, and it seems like it's happening, of your relationship deteriorating further and you're losing more and more respect for him and, and sexual interest in him and, and other aspects of your relationship, trust and, and uh, you know, and, and all those things kind of um, um, dying and dismantling. Um, in term, so it is very, I think it can be helpful to think of it in terms of uh, him having an addiction and that there is a medi- he's medicating with it it, 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 if somebody cannot easily stop it and just say, hey, you know, I'm sorry it's bothering you, I'll give it up, and they're really attached to it, they can be attached to it in a biochemical way similar to uh, a person who has like a cocaine problem or methamphetamine. And so to just say, will you give this up, um, they, you know, it's, it's, if you were to say that to a drug addict, you know, it's, it, we, we think, oh, that would be a very hard thing to expect. Uh, so, so much depends on the person with the problem, recognizing that they have a serious problem, and deciding that they want to uh, move away from porn on their own, coming to that realization. People don't quit porn successfully if they have a serious problem with it just because the partner's upset about it. They often will uh, need, they need to get to a place on their own where they say, oh, my goodness, I'm going to lose all these things. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose my kids or I'm going to lose my jobs or I'm, I'm losing my integrity or my connection with my faith because of pornography and I'm not willing to give that much of myself up for this product. But he he doesn't sound like he's there yet or sees it as a problem. Right. When he when he turns on you and says, you know, um, you know, get over it. This isn't a big deal. You know, um, you know, you need to stick with your guns about how you feel about it, uh, and and um, that it, it isn't something you can just 
accept or integrate into the relationship. It is that it goes against so much of of um, it is have that it's having such a harmful effect. In counseling, what's great about doing some couples counseling in situations like this is you can you know when when I'm working with a couple, I'm often working to help each party understand the other. So there's uh, an opportunity for the uh, man who's using porn to talk about how he got into it and what it means to him and what his experience has been over time with it, where what his own concerns are about himself with it, if there are concerns there, and how he sees it. And then for the woman to talk about what porn means to her and, and what she sees the changes going on over time, and then to to really uh, work to understand each other better. That solutions often come where there's when there's this deeper understanding and you, you work against kind of fighting uh, about it and more, um, you know, just looking at it realistically. How is it operating for one person? How is it operating for the other person? And right. I, I think, Samantha, a question you've asked, uh, you know, are you being unreasonable? No, you're not. Right. The fact that you're absolutely hurting the way you are and Mm -hmm. he he doesn't see this. There's a there's a withdrawal, a a denial on his part that uh, comes from some distortion or some problem that he has. And I I think Wendy in talking to you has has really uh, implicitly made the suggestion, which I would explicitly make, which is that you can say to him, you know, rather than stop the porn, yes, I'd like you to stop it. I would. But you think I should just go with it, and this is something that we're just going to have to deal with, and not by ourselves. It seems to me we need some professional counseling help. Mm -hmm. Right. And I I have brought that up in the past, you know, probably six years ago, like I said, before I, you know, started having kids, and they're now my priority, you know, at least when they're this little. Um, how, how old are they, Samantha? They're three and five. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, and he, his, you know, his answer was, I don't have a problem, I don't need counseling, which, you know, that's, I, I'm assuming, the typical addict behavior. Denial, also, yeah. You know, I'm also, you know, I'm not unwilling to do, you know, for him to look at any porn, but it's just the images sometimes that are online, and I think now he's getting into watching the live sessions which is something that he had never done before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it gets worse and worse. It, it, it will, does. Yeah, and it will. It, uh, you're actually doing him a big favor by saying, no, what you're doing is unhealthy and harmful to you, to us, and you need help. And, and you the, can... the more firm you are, actually by saying, well, you can look at a little of this porn, you might be giving a mixed message, so you may need to get really clear on what your stance is. I I think uh, you can you can say you know you may not feel it's a problem but I do, and if I really feel it's a problem it's a problem for mm-hmm. us, mm-hmm. and let's go to see somebody maybe they'll tell me it's my problem but that much you have to do for me and you have to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good I luck, would, Samantha. I, yeah, Thank I would you wonder very much. what what he would be uh, willing to sacrifice for the relationship, you know, if there's, if he feels that... When, right. when a person starts seeing that their porn use and they recognize their porn use is, has become more important than their marriage or than their um, mental health in other ways, then, you know, they can start getting to that place where they, they recognize something needs to be done. Let's go now to our next caller, who is Susan from Missouri. Hi, Susan. Hello. I think maybe some of my uh, I've gotten some answers. Good. It's my 30, 36-year-old son who is, has been addicted, and we keep wondering, why is he not marrying? And the more I hear about this addiction, I can see why. But as a mother, there's very little I can do. Except I got the book Porn Trap, and who's that by? That's by, by our guest Wendy Maltz. You're talking to the author. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, Wendy. What's the last name? Maltz. M A L T Z. M A L T Z. Well, that's the start. Because see, as a mother, there's nothing much I can do. But we just uh, his brother, his twin brother, attended a seminar, a workshop about this and how it affects his hormonal 
the the love the inability for him to have that the, the hormone that helps develop relationships. Yeah, it's, oxytocin and the bonding hormones. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and so his brother brought it to our attention, and we always were wondering, oh gosh, I think this is what's keeping him from being able to marry. But you know, he's thirty six and has his career, and he seems to be happy. But every time we have family gatherings, um, his focus on sex is almost embarrassing for me. And I just, it's like, you can't tell him because then he feels like you're being, you're criticizing him. Well, you are, but it's all right. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it, it, it's new for me to how to deal with this as an addiction. So I thought, well, could I get him the book? You think that would help? Or what could the family, his dad, his brother, what could we do? Because right now he, he would not acknowledge that it's a problem. Is his brother close to him? Well, they're twins, but... Um, uh, Are they identical twins? No. Yeah. No, and when they were growing up, uh, the one who has the problem would refer to his brother as the perfect son. Oh, because dear. The, because the one who has the problem was also had about four years of drug use. Yeah. And then he finally turned his life around. But I think what's happened, he's, from your show, he has substituted addiction, uh, or he has the pornography for the, the drugs. I, I think uh, somebody's got to talk to him, and I think it might be whoever is the person he's most likely to listen to. His is the, dad. Is his dad. Yeah. Is then his father is the one that should talk to him. And I don't, and his father can start out by saying, I'm really concerned. Mm-hmm. Not you have a problem, mm-hmm. but I'm really concerned, and this is what I've con- is concerning me, and this is what I've seen. And he can say, I am so proud of what you've done in terms of overcoming drug addiction, but I think you're using the same kind of mechanism in a different way. And just, just sort of keep at it. <laughs> you know, it's it, you, you cannot... The old, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mm-hmm. But you do have, as a parent, the desire, the obligation, and I think the opportunity on your husband's part to, Wait, to talk to him. Should my husband read the book? Should he read the book first? Yes, I, I would recommend the, that your husband read the book. And then, you know, you you can uh, suggest somebody read a book, but you can't make them read it. I mean, you can say, here's a book. I've read it. I found it helpful in understanding, you know, what you might be going through. Um, I'll just leave it with you if you want to read it fine or now or at some point in the future. It might be uh, something that you you, uh, choose to look at. I have had people contact me and say that um, a relative gave them the the book, The Porn Trap, and they uh, then recognized themselves in it and saw what was happening to themselves and and realize they had a problem, but um, uh, you know I don't think it's that easy. Uh, just like with any other drug uh, drug use, often it can take uh, several years of having uh, negative consequences or people sharing their concern until the uh, the heavy porn user uh, recognizes that that what they're doing is is harmful to themselves and and that they want to stop. We do have a, a caller now that might be interesting for you to hear, too, Susan, because we've had a lot of women calling up, but th- we do have a caller, Brian, from Texas on the line, and it would be interesting to hear from him. Hello, Brian. Thank you for calling. Hello, and thanks for taking my call. I've enjoyed your program, and there's a lot of good advice there, uh, and I, I hope a lot of people are listening to your, your advice. Thank you. What can we do for you? Well, I have been, um, oh, I would say probably addicted to porn for some time, and probably six months ago, um, I decided to, uh, I got rid of sort of my secret stash. I had about 25 DVDs, and I, I cleared all the, uh, the sites out of my computer, and I, and I stopped doing all that, and I, you know, was up front and honest with my wife about the problem that I had, and I told her that I really didn't, didn't want to be, um, addicted to that anymore because I, I really began to feel sort of separated, not only from her, but separated from myself and my values. And, um, I just really began to feel uh, out of control. You good, know? F- good for you to recognize mm-hmm. it, Brian. Good for you. Go, go ahead. 
Yeah, the question I have now is that I really want to... But my, my wife and I have used porn uh, occasionally together, and we enjoy that. Um, but I've spent so much time on, on websites and looking at DVDs and stuff that I, I find sometimes just normal sex without the addition of porn can be a little boring and vanilla and and I don't I don't want it to be. I want I want there to be um, you know, more intimacy and more connection and more closeness. And you know, and I've been I've been married to my wife now for twenty three years and we were together for six or seven years before that. So, you know, I've been with her since I was sixteen and um and I love her very much and I want her to know that she's everything to me. I just you know, I just wanna I wanna ask a question about how to reestablish mm-hmm. some intimacy and kind of get over the, uh, it, it hasn't been easy giving this up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in the porn trap, there's a whole chapter devoted to uh, learning new approaches to touch and sex. And they, um, like there's one exercise called looking with love where you, uh, you know, in pornography, it's so much looking at, the porn for stimulation of what's coming into your eyes looking at with love involves looking at your partner and um feeling the caring you have from your heart actually come up and and go out of your eyes as you gaze it's it's learning uh, a love gaze and there's also exercises that called heart anchoring where you actually you feel your caring as you touch and um uh, get receive stimulation to uh, to your genitals or just to to skin. There's there's a, a lot of you know what porn doesn't show kind of how to integrate emotional feeling and sensuality in in sex. So you, learning how to do that can be very helpful. Some couples I've uh, talked with said that. They've they've gotten into tantric sex practices and or Kareza. Some of the they've learned about um, some some of these um, methods for integrating uh, feeling, emotional feeling, and and more full body sensuality and, and awareness in sex. So okay. you, you can go that route, but you know if you're looking for a strong kind of adrenaline filled punch. With a like a strong kick kind of sex, I think there's is some uh, recognition that it's it's probably it may happen from time to time on occasion in with your right. wife, but it, it it this kind of sex, it's um, more uh, it, it's different than the kind of sex that porn delivers. Porn delivers a very high stimulation, is often uh, adrenaline fueled kind of sex because it goes to with the images sort of the outer limits of what we're uh, we're comfortable with or is shock value right. and, and this right. uh, the, and even the fear of getting caught can can come in there or doing something naughty or looking at something naughty you don't get that in like love based sex but what you can get are some of these deeper fuller satisfactions where you can learn to tune in more to the um uh, the the uh, attraction and uh, early stages of arousal, or the uh, heightened um, stages in the plateau stage of the sexual response cycle, and and also uh, how to enjoy orgasm where it 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 has a meaningfulness involved in it, and then right. and then the afterglow to appreciate that as well. So there can be these deeper satisfactions that are more based on nurturing touch and soothing. Uh, porn is, it stimulates the appetitive kind of um, interest in sex, the, but it doesn't do, it doesn't really give the deeper satisfactions that love-based sex can. And the longer you're away from it, um, the, uh, the more your body and your brain will readjust. This is the good news we're hearing is that people who quit and actually really stay away from it. They don't re-stimulate with it every now and then, but they completely uh-huh. give it up. And then that they do readjust, and then they find themselves like learning these new dimensions of sexual pleasure and enjoyment. And, um, 
you know, and, and then I, I get people writing in saying that they have, um, they never thought that sex could be so, such a, a, um, a full pleasure because there's nothing negative that happens afterwards. They, afterwards, right. they don't feel shame. They feel just right. a higher self-esteem, closer, more connected if they're with a partner, and, and they haven't had to give anything up. So, so um, yeah, I would just kind of stick with it, but don't expect the same kind of um, high stimulation or punch that porn delivered. And okay. you have to gr- well, gr- good, grieve the loss of that, yeah. Thank you very, very much for calling us, Brian, and I think that was a, a wonderful explanation, Wendy. You're listening to Sexual Health and Well-Being. This is Dr. Virginia Sadock director of the program in human sexuality at NYU Langone Medical Center. And my guest this hour has been Wendy Maltz, author of The Porn Trap, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Problems Caused by Pornography. And thank you so much for joining us today, Wendy. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure and best wishes to everyone. Thank you.